Hi, everyone. Welcome in. Um, I know we're right at 12, but we're going to give it a minute or two just to let people um, enter the Zoom room, and then we'll get started. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to today's discussion of autonomous weapon systems and international humanitarian law. My name is Olivia Kempf and I'll be presenting today. I'm a legal intern with the IHL team at American Red Cross National Headquarters. And I'm also a second year law student at American University Washington College of Law here in DC. So this is meant to be an informative session where I'll introduce you to some of the most significant contemporary issues facing the development of autonomous weapon systems and their regulation under international law. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat or in the Q&A box um, in the Q&A feature. I'll leave some time at the end to have a brief Q&A. So I will start off with a brief introduction to autonomous weapon systems what they are, how they're being used today, and what regulatory mechanisms are already in place, as well as which international body is at the center of negotiations over a potential new regulatory instrument. Then I'll move to a discussion of the dispute in the international community over a universal definition, the ethical concerns inherently raised by autonomous weapons, and the regulations that have been proposed. So first, what are autonomous weapon systems? The exact definition is the subject of much debate in the international community. Now I'll get into the specifics of that debate later, but autonomous weapon systems as the general public understands them are weapons that use artificial intelligence technology to automate some or all of their functions in carrying out military operations. <clears throat> artificial intelligence is a technology that can be applied to a whole host of existing weapons. So the functions and purposes will differ from weapon to weapon. And there are, in fact, are already a number of autonomous weapon systems in use today. There are three levels of autonomy that can make it easier to understand these existing and potential autonomous weapons and their capabilities. Semi-autonomous, supervised autonomous, and fully autonomous. Semi-autonomous weapons are human in the loop weapons, where a human operator launches the weapon, which then autonomously identifies and engages with a target that has been predetermined by the human operator. A perfect example of this is a homing munitions system, where a human operator decides on a particular target and launches the weapon, which then autonomously tracks the target and engages. Supervised autonomous weapons are human on the loop weapons, which detect, select, and engage targets autonomously, but which are supervised by a human operator who can intervene at any time. This category includes certain defensive systems that are used today, which use a pre-programmed list of acceptable targets to autonomously identify and intercept enemy aircraft and other missiles. And fully autonomous weapons are the least prevalent and the subject of the most concern from the international community, both legally and ethically. Fully autonomous weapon systems are human out of the loop systems for which there is no human intervention beyond the initial launch of the weapon. This category can include certain loitering munitions, which includes fire and forget weapons that are programmed to autonomously fly to a predefined loitering area and search for and engage targets without human intervention. And now I say can because these types of weapons in reality as they are now are programmed with and used with semi or supervised autonomous modes. Autonomous weapon systems are the subject of much debate in the interna international legal community, not only because of their ethical implications, but because of their potential to violate international law. Some have called for an outright preemptive ban on the development and use of all autonomous weapon systems, while others, notably Human Rights Watch and the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots, have called for a prohibition on certain types of autonomous weapon systems and regulation of others which are deemed more legally and ethically acceptable. As of now, there is no comprehensive regulatory scheme designed specifically to address autonomous weapon systems. 
This doesn't mean that they aren't being regulated, but that they are merely subject to the principles of international humanitarian law that are applicable to all weapon systems. Though looking to existing principles is a helpful baseline, there's a growing movement to create new international law that directly outlines how IHL would govern autonomous weapon systems and to identify any weapons or uses that would be per se or categorically unlawful. The difficulty with any proposed regulation is striking the balance between wanting to get ahead of the future technological development by restricting advancements that would violate international law on the one hand and creating an instrument that won't become obsolete as the technology develops on the other. So this regulation would therefore need to be both narrowly prescribed enough to be effective at its inception and broad enough to apply to future iterations of autonomous weapon systems as the technology develops. A treaty regulating autonomous weapon systems has already been proposed by multiple states as a potential protocol six to the United Nations Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, or the CCW, which places restrictions on the use of weapons, which may be deemed to be excessively injurious or to have indiscriminate effects. Since 2017, the UN has convened a yearly meeting of the Group of Governmental Experts on Emerging Technologies in the Area of Lethal Autonomous Weapon Systems, which is an incredibly long name, so I'll just refer to it as the GGE. The GGE's mission statement is to explore and agree on possible recommendations on options related to emerging technologies in the area of lethal autonomous weapon systems in the context of the objectives and purposes of the CCW. Each year, parties to the CCW and NGOs are invited to submit working papers and statements addressing the topics of discussion selected for that particular year. Now, I'll note here that um, even though the GGE refers to the technology as lethal autonomous weapon systems, this tends to denote a particular subset of autonomous weapons, one which can apply lethal force. So for precision, precision of language, I'll just be for referring to the class of weapons as a whole as autonomous weapon systems without the lethal component. In 2019, the GGE established 11 guiding principles to shape all future work by the group and influence the development of a legal framework. These principles serve as an excellent summary of the findings and objectives of the GGE over the years. And I'll call your attention to them as they become relevant throughout the presentation. So the first problem that the GGE ran into is the lack of a common definition of autonomous weapon systems. In order for any regulation to be effective, states need to be able to agree on a universal definition of autonomous weapon systems so that they can uniformly apply the substantive law. In seeking proposals from states, the GGE has attempted to create a working definition that helps to draw the line between acceptable and unacceptable autonomous weapon systems. The general consensus in the international community seems to be to ban fully autonomous lethal weapons, which operate completely outside of human control and are designed to attack with lethal force. What this leaves is the need to then regulate semi-autonomous and non-lethal autonomous weapon systems, drawing that line between acceptable and unacceptable systems and uses. Proposed definitions have generally fallen into one of three categories weapons defined by machine learning capabilities, by the level of human machine interaction, or by the types of functions to be performed autonomously. <clears throat> the first type of definition, like this one proposed by Brazil in 2020, classifies a weapon system as autonomous based on its ability to recognize patterns in, in combat environments, learn to operate and make decisions regarding the critical functions, based on uploaded databases, acquired experiences, and its own calculations and conclusions. Other examples of this type of definition include classification based on the ability to understand higher level intent and be able to decide upon a course of action to bring about a desired outcome without human oversight. This definition comes very close to classifying autonomous weapon systems as weapons with human level intelligence, which would theoretically be charged with making the types of complex decisions that normally fall on human commanders. This definition is likely too narrow as many iterations of autonomous weapon systems, including some of those that are used today would not be included in the classification. 
The second type of definition classifies autonomous weapon systems based on the level of interaction with the human operator. Here are a couple examples. A weapon system that once activated can select and engage targets without future intervention by the operator. Weapon systems that completely exclude the human factor from decisions about their employment and so on. Defining autonomous weapon systems by the role that the human operator plays is useful in understanding the differing levels of autonomy that exist, particularly in differentiating between the human in the loop, on the loop, and out of the loop systems that I described earlier. However, the third type of definition, which classifies autonomous weapons um, by the types of functions to be performed autonomously, rather than solely by the role of the human operator, expands on the second type by including those systems which have autonomous capabilities, even though there still may be a high level of human-machine interaction. This type of definition has gained broad acceptance by states and NGOs, and it is the category most commonly proposed by state parties to the CCW in their submissions to the GGE. <clears throat> Excuse me. Examples include a weapon system incorporating autonomy in its critical functions, specifically target selection and engagement, and weapon systems that incorporate autonomy into their critical functions of selecting, targeting, and engaging to apply force without human intervention. If you're thinking that this category of definition seems pretty similar to the previous one, you'd be right. The key difference is that here, it's the autonomous capabilities of the weapon system rather than the interaction with the human operator that drives its classification. This may seem like merely a semantic difference, but this last category supports the assertion that many in the international community have that a level of meaningful human control should always be maintained over any weapon system. If we classify autonomous weapon systems only by the role of the human operator, we, we may run the risk of under-including weapons that have autonomous capabilities and should therefore be subject to any regulations governing autonomous weapon systems, but which also have a high degree of human-machine interaction. Another objective of establishing a common definition is to attempt to draw a line between acceptable and unacceptable categories of autonomous weapon systems. Under Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, state parties are under an obligation to determine whether the employment of any new weapon would, in some or all circumstances, be prohibited by international law. <clears throat> and remember the guiding principles that I mentioned earlier? This requirement is outlined in Guiding Principle E, identified by the GGE, requiring states to make this determination in the study, development, acquisition, or adoption of any new weapon. So what qualities would make an autonomous weapon system per se or categorically unlawful under IHL? There are some characteristics which will always make a weapon per se unlawful and which are primarily drawn from the core principles of IHL. New weapon systems will need to be evaluated for these characteristics at all stages of the development process in order to ensure that their very design complies with IHL. First, weapon systems that are designed to be used to conduct attacks against the civilian population, including terror attacks, would categorically violate the principle of distinction. This includes weapons which cannot be directed at a specific military objective and would therefore have indiscriminate effects. Weapon systems designed to cause incidental loss of civilian life that would invariably be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated would violate the principle of proportionality. And third, weapons of a nature to cause superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering are per se unlawful. Now these three characteristics may apply a little differently to autonomous weapon systems than to other novel weapons that have been developed throughout history. This is because of the unique nature of the technology itself. An autonomous weapon system does not necessarily denote a certain payload or type of ammunition. It's rather a technology which can be applied to a whole host of existing weapons. So the evaluation here may depend more on the type of weapon to be used autonomously than on the classification as autonomous itself. And other commonly proposed characteristics that would make an autonomous weapon system per se unlawful include the impossibility for termination, meaning that once engaged, there is no way for a human operator to intervene and terminate the device. 
and full autonomy, where there is a complete absence of human intervention or control throughout the entire process of executing a task. There are also characteristics that have been identified through state submissions to the GGE that may not automatically make a weapon unlawful, but it can assist in making this determination during weapons reviews. I'll emphasize again here that any autonomous weapon needs to be evaluated at all stages of the development process so that it is designed in accordance with the requirements of international law. First, the weapon must be predictable. Engineers and human operators need to have knowledge of how an autonomous weapon will, will likely function in any given circumstances of use and the effects that are likely to result. Unpredictability can stem from a number of problems, from system design flaws inherent to the technical design or human error or even bias in the use of the weapon. If a weapon's effects are unpredictable, it may be impossible to ensure its compliance with the principles of distinction, proportionality, and the prohibition on superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering, among other IHL rules. Second, the weapon must be explainable. Human operators need to be able to understand why an autonomous weapon system makes a certain decision in order to trust that the outcome will comply with the requirements of international law. Notably, scientists in the civilian sector have identified some ways that AI can become more explainable. And this includes uh, producing a list of critical factors that influence the machine's decision or producing a visual display that shows the determinative features used to make a decision. And third, the weapon must be reliable. Human operators must know how consistently the system will function as it is intended without failures or unintended effects. Similarly to unpredictable weapons, it may be impossible to ensure an unreliable weapon's compliance with proportionality, distinction, and the prohibition on superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering. Though unreliability can also stem from either inherent design flaws or human error, this evaluation is particularly important in the design and programming stage. Autonomous weapon systems need to be designed to respond consistently as they are intended. Though predictability, explainability, and reliability are the core characteristics to evaluate in the design of an autonomous weapon system, there are a few others that need to be considered in order to ensure that the weapons are capable of complying with IHL in all circumstances. The weapon's ability to be subject to intervention ties into the core IHL principles of distinction and proportionality. Facts on the ground that need to be considered in performing a distinction or proportionality analysis prior to an attack can change extremely quickly. Excuse me. Human commanders need to be able to call back the weapon if it is determined after launch that the attack is no longer in compliance with IHL. Included in this is the requirement that any autonomous weapon system be automatically deactivated if it, if it becomes disconnected from command, whether by extreme weather, an accident, or damage. If the human operator can no longer exercise control over the weapon, it is no longer reliable and the risk of mistakes or failures increases. The weapon's ability to self-adapt should also be evaluated. Of course, we want autonomous weapon systems to be able to adapt if they encounter, for example, a physical obstacle or if their targets change locations. What I mean here is that developers and users of autonomous weapon systems should consider its ability to expand its own functions and capabilities based on interaction with the environment or to redefine its own goals or objectives. If a weapon can autonomously change its capabilities, it is no longer predictable, explainable, or reliable. The human operator may not be able to understand or predict functions or outcomes. Allowing an autonomous weapon system to alter its own objectives would mean that it is carrying out tasks typically delegated to a human commander. This raises huge ethical and legal concerns. Should a machine really be allowed to make tactical, operational, or strategic decisions on its own without the instruction of a human commander? So this brings me to another of the most significant contemporary issues facing autonomous weapons development, the ethical debate. Ethical concerns have been raised by states and NGOs since before the first meeting of the GGE. And these concerns typically fall into two categories. Objections based on the limits of the technology to function within legal and ethical norms, 
and ethical objections that are independent of technological capability, otherwise known as universal ethical concerns. Objections that center on the technological limits of the weapon system are generally context and weapon specific. These are concerns about a particular weapon's ability to conform with IHL and international ethical norms in a specific context based on its technological specifications. These aren't objections to the existence of autonomous weapons themselves, but rather to specific instances of their use that may run contrary to international legal and ethical norms. These problems will likely be addressed in whatever regulatory mechanism is developed, as I'll discuss further in the section on proposals for substantive regulation. So what I'd like to focus a little bit more on today are the universal ethical concerns, meaning concerns over the existence of autonomous weapon systems as a whole. These concerns tend to focus on the delegation of the decision to use force, particularly against human targets to a machine rather than it being made by a human commander. The first universal concern is the responsibility or accountability gap, where concerns have been raised that by delegating the decision to use force to a machine, there is no longer an accountability mechanism if something goes wrong. If the machine is the entity making the final decision, who is held criminally responsible if a violation of international law results? The human operator, their commander, or the engineer who designed the particular weapon? This question is addressed by the GGE in Guiding Principle B, which states that human responsibility for decisions on the use of weapon systems must be retained since accountability cannot be transferred to machines. This should be considered across the entire life cycle of the weapon system. The International Committee of the Red Cross, in a 2018 submission to the GGE, expressed the same sentiment, stating that responsibility and accountability for decisions to use force cannot be transferred to a machine or a computer program. These are human responsibilities which require human agency in the decision-making process. The accountability gap can be split further into two ethical requirements for legal accountability and moral accountability. Legal accountability requires that there be some established process for holding an individual accountable for the consequences of their actions, either the operator or commander who authorizes the activation of the weapon, or in the case of malfunction, the programmers or manufacturers of the technology. The topic of individual accountability under IHL could probably be an entire presentation in itself. So I'll just say here that there are existing mechanisms in place to hold individuals accountable it just needs to be ensured that the same process is, is made applicable to autonomous weapon systems. Moral accountability requires that the human commander's intent be directly linked to the outcome of the attack so that we find them, rather than the machine, morally responsible for the result. To ensure this, we go back to the requirements of predictability, explainability, and reliability. Commanders need to understand how and why the weapon will function the way that it does and be able to rely on its consistency in order to effectuate their, their intent in, in carrying out the operation. Delegating the decision to engage to a machine would also prevent considerations of humanity. Even where something or someone is a legitimate target, the human operator still has the choice to forego the attack based on considerations of humanity rooted in human emotions that cannot be programmed into a machine. The other most significant universal concern is that delegating the decision to use force to a machine undermines the human dignity of combatants and any civilians who may be put at risk. The ICRC and its submissions to the GGE has emphasized that it matters not just if a person is killed and injured, but how they are killed and injured. Part of the Red Cross's movement, um, part, part of its mission is to uphold and ensure respect for human dignity, particularly during armed conflict. And United Nations Special Rapporteur Christoph Haynes similarly said that to allow machines to determine when and where to use force against humans is to reduce those humans to objects. This relates closely to another universal concern, that increasing human distancing from the decision to use force will make the use of force easier and less controlled. Even with proper accountability measures, distancing human operators from the use of force would make them more willing to morally accept it because there is a machine between them and the target which is making that call. Finally, 
There's a concern that autonomous weapon systems inherently raise the potential for unintended harm in carrying out their operations. For example, an autonomous loitering munition system that can only detect radar signatures may not be able to recognize the presence of civilians or civilian objects that may appear in the radar's immediate vicinity and may cause unintended harm, even if otherwise carrying out its mission as intended. Now on the other side of the ethical debate are those who have considered the potential of autonomous weapon systems to enable better respect for both international law and human ethical values. This potential has also been identified by the GGE through guiding principle H, which states that consideration should be given to the use of autonomous weapon systems in upholding compliance with IHL and other applicable international legal obligations. In 2018, the United States submitted a paper to the GGE identifying five ways that autonomous weapon systems and AI can reduce risks to civilians, not by taking over the decision-making process themselves, but by assisting human commanders to make more accurate and more efficient operational decisions. So this list is by no means an exhaustive list of the potential humanitarian benefits, it's generally a good summary. So some of these uses consider the application of AI technology more broadly rather than specifically for weapons. Um, and this is because the GGE and its discussions has considered many applications of AI in military operations in addition to autonomous weapon systems themselves. So first, Incorporating autonomous self-destruct deactivation or neutralization mechanisms would inherently lower the risk of inadvertently striking civilians and civilian objects. In practice, these mechanisms would automatically render the weapon harmless in, in the case that it fails, after it fulfills its military purpose, or after a period of time if it detects that its mission has not been successful. Because the situation on the ground can change so quickly, setting a time limit for self-deactivation would reduce the risk that civilians or civilian objects enter and turn an otherwise lawful operation into an unlawful one, for example. The United States has already implemented the requirement for these types of mechanisms into its own national system of weapons review. Requi requiring autonomous weapon systems to complete engagements in the time frame consistent with commander and operator intentions and if unable to do so, terminate engagements or seek additional human operator input before continuing engagement. Second, artificial intelligence can increase awareness of civilians and civilian objects on the battlefield. Because artificial intelligence systems can search through large amounts of data more quickly than humans, it can sift through the overwhelming amount of information that human commanders must consider during military operations and identify objects of interest. The human commander would then evaluate these objects and make the final decision, but the use of AI technology would streamline this process. If used correctly, the United States says, it would enable commanders to better assess the expected incidental loss to civilians and to take proper precautions, which again ties into those core IHL principles. Artificial intelligence can also improve assessments of the likely effects of military operations. Software is already being used to predict the likely effects of different types of weapons, and applying AI to this practice would produce these pred predictions more quickly and potentially improve their accuracy. This would assist in carrying out proportionality and precautions assessments, making a human commander's judgment more accurate and effective than it may have been before. Weapons that have, or that have automated targeting functions, meaning their identification, tracking, selection, and engagement functions, can be more accurate and pose less, less risk of collateral damage. Weapons that are more accurate reduce the number of weapons needed uh, to generate the same military advantage. Increased accuracy can also mean that a smaller warhead can be used to generate the same military effect. The thinking here is that if you can hit the target accurately the first time and with only the minimum amount of force necessary, this reduces the overall risk to civilians and other protected objects by reducing the number and caliber of weapons discharged. And finally, autonomous weapon systems reduce the need for immediate fires and self-defense, which may inadvertently harm civilians or civilian objects. In situations where immediate self-defense is needed, there often isn't enough time for a human to consider proper precautions or perform a proportionality analysis on the ground. 
Autonomous weapon systems, which can sense the direction or location of incoming fire, can reduce the risk of misidentifying the source of hostile fire, thereby reducing collateral damage. So what does all this mean for the regulation of autonomous weapon systems? I'll turn now to a discussion of proposed regulations. Since 2021, states participating in the GGE meetings have turned to recommending draft articles or model le legal frameworks built upon the guiding principles and findings from previous years. These proposed regulations of and limitations on autonomous weapon systems attempt to strike a balance between the humanitarian and military benefits of autonomous weapon systems and the ethical and legal concerns of delegating decision-making authority to a machine. And I'm gonna pause right here and just remind you if there's any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I see a lot of people have been commenting in there. Also feel free to use the Q&A feature um, and we will leave some time at the end to, to go through all the questions. Let me, I'm saying a lot of words, so I'm gonna take a sip of water real quick. Okay. <clears throat> so substantive regulations. Guiding Principle K states that the CCW offers an appropriate framework for dealing with autonomous weapon systems within the context of the objectives and purposes of the convention, which seeks to strike a balance between military necessity and humanitarian considerations. States have therefore modeled their proposals after existing protocols to the CCW, whose effects range from banning specific classes of weapons entirely to defining how existing IHL principles would apply to and restrict the use of a particular class of weapons. So take protocol two of the CCW, for example, which places prohibitions or restrictions on the use of mines, booby traps, and other devices. This protocol starts with a list of definitions, outlining the precise types of weapons to be regulated. Now, this is why the dispute over a universal definition of autonomous weapon systems is so significant. The class of weapons to be regulated must be defined specifically enough for these regulations to be effective, but also broadly enough to enable the instrument to adapt to new technological developments and not become obsolete. Following the list of definitions, Protocol 2 goes on to outline how existing IHL principles, including distinction, proportionality, and precautions, would apply to mines, booby traps, and other devices. It generally prohibits targeting of civilians and civilian objects with these weapons, indiscriminate uses, and uses which may be expected to uh, violate the proportionality principle. It also states almost verbatim the IHL requirement to take all feasible precautions to protect civilians from harm. Any instrument that regulates autonomous weapon systems would likely begin with a similar article, outlining how existing IHL governs their use. In fact, almost all of the draft articles or frameworks proposed at the 2023 GGE meeting included this language. Protocol two then goes on to outline more specific restrictions on each type of weapon, tailoring the legal requirements to the unique characteristics of each one. An instrument regulating autonomous weapon systems would likely follow the same structure, outlining limitations on the design of autonomous weapon systems and restrictions on their use. Design restrictions would likely focus on the factors that I discussed earlier, like restricting weapons which are not predictable, explainable, or reliable, or which would not be susceptible to human intervention or would be able to autonomously change their own objectives. Proposed restrictions on the use of autonomous weapons include limits on the types of target that the weapon would be permitted to engage. For example, limiting the weapon to machine on machine attacks or constraining attacks to objects that are military objectives by nature and generally wouldn't change status to become protected. Other proposed restrictions are on the duration, geographic scope, and scale of use. A duration restriction could mean that the weapon self-deactivates after a certain time where the mission is not completed, for example, like the United States described in its humanitarian benefits paper. States have also proposed restrictions on situations of use or operational context. For example, um, Pakistan in a 2023 submission to the GGE proposed that autonomous weapon systems must be designed to only operate in situations where civilians and civilian objects are not present. This section will likely include positive obligations as well as restrictions, like a requirement for meaningful human control. 
which is a concept proposed by many in the international community who raise the ethical concerns over the accountability gap and the potential lack of respect for human dignity. Now this phrase is subject to different definitions, but it generally means the preservation of human judgment over the use of force or human control over how weapons are used, what or whom they are used against and the effects of their use. A requirement for meaningful human control by setting a floor for human machine interaction essentially sets a ceiling for autonomy. Many are of the opinion that there is an implicit requirement for meaningful human control embedded in IHL itself through the core principles which require analyses that can only be effectively performed by humans. The GGE set out a slightly modified version of this requirement in guiding principle C, which says that human machine interaction, which may take various forms and be implemented at various stages of the life cycle of a weapon, should ensure that the potential use of autonomous weapon systems is in compliance with applicable law, in particular IHL. In determining the quality and extent of human machine interaction, a range of factors should be considered, including the operational context and the characteristics and capabilities of the weapon system as a whole. Here, the GGE isn't necessarily requiring a specific minimum level of human control, just enough to ensure compliance with international law. States have implemented this requirement into their proposed regulations in different ways. For example, requiring states to implement measures to ensure effective human oversight of any weapon system and allow for intervention and deactivation at all times, or to ensure the capacity of humans to limit the type of target, duration, geographical scope, and scale of use. The requirement for meaningful human control directly addresses the accountability gap. As long as a human is in charge, there is someone to be held accountable if something goes wrong. Many states have combined the requirements for meaningful human control and accountability into the same draft article. Like this example, a group of states, including the US, UK, Japan, South Korea, and others, and their draft article on accountability measures required operation of autonomous weapon systems within a responsible chain of human command and control. So how would these regulations, particularly those on the design of autonomous weapon systems, function practically on the state level? The GGE has also discussed internal requirements, including those for ensuring proper use and for establishing national systems of weapons reviews that ensure compliance with IHL. This is another topic that could probably be an entire uh, discussion on its own, so I'll just cover the key requirements that are likely to be placed on states in conducting these weapons reviews. To ensure proper use of autonomous weapon systems, states would be encouraged to provide readily understandable human machine interfaces and controls, guidance for personnel regarding proper use of the weapon systems under IHL, training of personnel on the capabilities and limitations of the weapon systems autonomous functions, and appropriate rules or directives limiting improper use of the weapon system in military operations. All of this goes to ensuring that the weapons are predictable, explainable, reliable, and used in compliance with IHL and any specific requirements of the potential treaty. As for national weapons reviews, states will be under the obligation to ensure that at each stage of design and development, the requirements of international law are being met. The GGE has outlined two specific suggestions for these reviews. Guiding principle G, states that risk assessments and mitigation measures should be part of all stages of the development process. And guiding principle F encourages states to consider physical security, appropriate non-physical safeguards like cybersecurity measures, the risk of acquisition by terrorist groups, and the risk of proliferation when developing or acquiring autonomous weapon systems. <clears throat> Because these are suggestions, not requirements on the international level, they're likely to become part of national policies for acquisition and development. For example, the United States Department of Defense recently updated its directive on autonomy and weapon systems, which sets out its process for acquisition and development of autonomous weapon systems, including an outline of its review process and its requirement for personnel training. Finally, and although it's not a strict requirement, states are encouraged to share the processes that they develop domestically to ensure compliance with international law, including their policies on 
acquisition and development, personnel training, and weapons reviews. This is generally referred to as the voluntary sharing of best practices and encourages states to contribute their findings to the international community in order to optimize national practices worldwide. This is, of course, always done in consideration of national security concerns, but it's likely part of the reason that the US Department of Defense, for example, publicly released their directive. So this brings us to the end of our discussion of autonomous weapon systems and international humanitarian law. And I know this is, there was a lot of information in this presentation, um, and, and I'm sure there's, there could be a couple more hours of this if we wanted there to be. But I hope you've all learned something new today and that you've come away with an understanding of, of what the current state of the law on this topic is and the discussions that are happening in the international community. Now, I'd like to point out that um, all of the information here, particularly from the GGE, is uh, publicly available on the UN's website. So if you're interested in keeping up with this, I would point you towards that. There will be another, um, another meeting of the GGE in 2024, where they will continue accepting proposals for legal frameworks, for draft articles, etc. And hopefully moving us closer to establishing a substantive set of rules that will govern autonomous weapon systems. Okay, so I will turn it over to my team members who are going to read out some of the questions that we've received. Uh, well, it looks like my camera is not working for some reason. So um, I'm here, Olivia, though. I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right, okay. Sorry about that. We'll figure out what's going on there. But um, I guess the first question uh, that we have is, and I know some of this, the answers you, you kind of touched on, so I think you, it, you would just have to rephrase some of the stuff you said. But I think the first question is, even if the international community is successful in producing a treaty that would regulate autonomous weapons, how do we know that states will agree to sign? Yeah, so, so it's definitely true that in order for any regulatory treaty to be effective, you know, states have to be willing to sign on to it. They have to be willing to become a signatory party and be legally bound. And predicting this can be a little bit difficult, um, but for weapons law in particular, um, I'll, I'll direct you to Sean Watts, who's the co-director of the Lieber Institute. Um, he wrote an excellent paper identifying six characteristics of weapons themselves that can indicate the likelihood that states um, will be willing to be bound by any regulatory measures. And these, these include like, for example, their disruptiveness to the international order, their notoriety in the public opinion, um, their effectiveness in achieving military advantages, their compatibility with existing medical treatments, um, their novelty, and uh, the extent to which the weapon is already being used by states. Um, so there's a lot of nuance to this topic and there are some papers that actually do discuss this framework and with autonomous weapon systems in particular, but I'll just say it, it, they seem to fall somewhere in the middle with about half of the factors pointing towards states being willing to regulate and the other half pointing towards maybe states might be resistant to regulation. But I will say that it, it's really promising to see that so many states are engaging in an active effort through the GGE to create new international law regulating autonomous weapon systems. So um, to me, that just that seems very promising in terms of their willingness to be regulated in the future. All right, thank you for that. And the second question we have is, you mentioned some requirements for the actual design of the autonomous weapon system rather than its use, like the need for it to be reliable or explainable. Are, these, are those requirements written out anywhere in international law? So um, no, well, so these requirements, you know, reliability, explainability, predictability, they're not explicitly mentioned anywhere in IHL and the Geneva Conventions, anything like that, but they are tied to rules that are explicitly mentioned. So like proportionality, distinction, um, precautions, the prohibition on superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering, those core IHL principles. Um, if we take the proportionality analysis, for example, um, where commanders need to evaluate the expected losses to civilians and weigh them against the um, military advantage anticipated, the commander needs to be able to know, you know how the weapon is gonna function. Um, they need to know that it will function consistently and you know, what the effects will be. And so if the weapon didn't meet those requirements, it would make a proportionality analysis pretty inaccurate. Um, 
or at least less accurate than it would be if a human was, was observing everything normally. Um, and so even though they aren't explicitly mentioned in the body of IHL, they're, they're tied to rules that are. Great. Um, and then just a, a follow-up to that, who does weapons reviews to assure objectivity? Yeah, so weapons reviews are typically national. Um, they're typically done by the states that are developing the, um, the weapons or acquiring the weapons. Um, as I kind of mentioned in, in the section on weapons reviews, the, the principles that the GGE set out are suggestions um, for states to implement in their own national policies, like the United States has done. And so, um, yeah, again, like the, the United States Department of Defense Directive, it outlines sort of the hierarchy for who is conducting these reviews, at what levels, um, what types of weapons are being reviewed, what those reviews entail. And so that's going to be part of the, the national policies. All right, excellent. And then we kind of have a uh, scenario specific question here, um, but considering weapon systems, are there safeguards in place for AI to identify and preserve the protected stat status of civil digital systems during potential, like what would be referred to as AI conducted cyber attacks? Yeah, so there, there are some emerging safeguards being conceptualized to protect civilian digital systems. Um, one notable initiative is the development of a digital protective emblem, similar to how we see physical protective emblems um, used in con conventional warfare under the Geneva Conventions. This digital emblem would be embedded within the code of civilian digital systems. And so it would signal their protected status um, to an AI operated cyber weapon. Uh, theoretically, AI systems would be programmed to recognize this emblem and refrain from targeting systems marked with it, so thereby preserving the integrity and neutrality of healthcare services during conflicts. Um, but the, the efficacy of these safeguards, it kind of depends on universal adherence. So, so whether states are actually willing to implement them on a, like um, universally and the technical precision of the AI systems in recognizing and respecting the digital emblem. All right, let me see what else. Um, how do these A IHL approaches to AI and autonomous weapons account for automatic override systems, which are designed to override human decision making based on criteria designed to detect human error? Um, I'm, I'll admit I'm not super familiar with AI override systems for human control. I know. Um, I'm sure this is a big concern is that there, you know, th this kind of goes into the requirement that AI systems should be subject to termination. They should be under the, under effective human control, meaningful human control at all times. Um, in, in the, in the instance of human error, um, let's see, like in, in essence, there should always be the human ability to terminate the engagement my immediate thought is that if an AI system does have the ability to override human error, a human would then see that and be able to terminate it if they determine that, you know, what, what the AI is about to do is unlawful. Um, and so I, I'm not sure if there's like a specific instance of this you're referring to or a specific weapon, but that's my thought. No, I understand. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're basically saying we, it, it can't be designed in a way where if, a human made an error, someone tried to correct it, the AI can't just tell the person, like, you know, say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not listening to you anymore. Is that what you're yeah, doing? This, yeah, it, it kind of goes to the ability to self-adapt, which I mentioned before as one of the characteristics that can make an autonomous weapon system unlawful. If they're able to autonomously change their own capabilities and change their own objectives, um, that could potentially be unlawful. Like I said, these are all just proposals at the moment. They're not, you know, specific legal requirements that have been written into international law. These are things that are being discussed and being proposed by, by states who are much more knowledgeable than me. And so, you know, we'll have to see how they deal with that in any potential regulatory instrument that gets written. Um, but my thought is that, you know, its ability to overcome the human decision would be problematic because of that requirement for human control. And the fact that, you know, we don't we don't necessarily want machines to be making 
decisions that human commanders would normally be making or to override those human commanders. Great. Um, and you tell me if we've already touched this, uh, but I always think it's something that comes up and we've had it come up a couple of times in the Q&A, but who is responsible in overseeing these laws are adhered to? And then we've had some questions about who is responsible to hold violators account to, accountable for violations of IHL. And I think that stems outside of autonomous weapons, but obviously it would include that as well. Yeah. So in terms of ensuring adherence to say, if there's a potential treaty, um, so I guess it will take, cause obviously there's not one right now and that's this whole discussion. And so if we take the proposition that this could be a potential protocol six to the CCW, the UN would be a major regulatory body there in, in ensuring compliance. Um, and then if, and then obviously states states are responsible on the national level for ensuring compliance internally, um, particularly if they're signatory parties, they have to ensure compliance. Um, and then in terms of accountability for violations of international law, um, that'll go to, I mean, there's, there's avenues for that. So, you know, whether it be an indictment from the ICC, the International Criminal Court, um, you know, something in the ICJ, or if, if maybe it's a part of an overarching scheme in a particular conflict, we might see the rise of a tribunal, a specific tribunal again, like we saw with the ICTY, for example. Um, and so like under international law, there are these tribunals and these avenues for individual and state accountability. Um, I'll admit I'm not an expert on individual and state accountability, but I, I will tell you that there are mechanisms out there to hold people accountable. Yeah, and usually when it comes to international law, the, the hope is and the requirement is, is that it usually starts at the state level and then international um, accountability mechanisms kick in if the state level's unwilling or unable to um, hold people accountable. Exactly, yeah, and, and thank you for, for adding that in, Christian. I, um, I think that's all the questions we have for right now. Um, Perfect. So thank you, Olivia. Yeah, of course. Um, and thank you all for coming. Oh, I forgot to mention the QR code on the screen. It'll take you to the IHL YouTube channel um, where you can view a lot of pretty much every one of our events gets uploaded there. Um, this webinar will be there as well in a bit um, once we get that all uploaded and everything. And so, yeah, thank you all again for taking the time out of your day to come listen and learn. I hope you've learned something new and um, that you, you know, feel a little bit more educated to talk about this topic with other people and share your thoughts. So yeah, thank you all for coming and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Friday. Thank you, Olivia, again.